the weirder it gets outside and the harder it gets outside, the more important it is to find our footing inside. This is a standard principle in psychology and resilience, and it's a fundamental teaching in the wisdom traditions around the world, which often are centrally concerned with deep matters of pain and loss and mortality. So the wisdom traditions around the world, uh, in their own ways, I think, uh, and we see this certainly in Buddhism, begin with suffering, begin with the first truth we face, the fact of suffering. It's not the entirety of life, it's not the only thing in life, uh, and still, there is suffering. Uh, so that's where we start. Um, we can learn, therefore, from people who have gone as far as anyone can go in various traditions around the world in terms of the cultivation of the most fundamental happiness, the, the deepest wisdom, the, the most unconditional love, the, the most stable, deep contentment and inner peace. And we can learn from them and um, work backwards from them, much as we would with people who are good at anything and kind of figure out or feel our way into or listen to our intuition about how do you do that, those people? What's it like to be you? And how can I establish that increasingly in myself? One of the things that uh, we learn from the wisdom traditions around the world, as well as very practical modern psychology and neuroscience, is the importance of, broadly defined, um, refuge. The notion that the weirder it gets out there, the more important it is to find a calm and a strength and a footing in here. So I'm gonna be exploring refuge of many kinds. Uh, in Buddhism, the three classic refuges are the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, which could be understood as the, the teaching, uh, pardon me, the teacher, the teaching, and the community of the taught. I'm also going to explore some very useful and hardcore psychological refuges that relate to the ways in which our brain has evolved in three major stages, reptilian, mammalian, and primate human, um, which have helped us become better and better at, at meeting our needs. And we can take refuge in growing strengths inside that can meet our needs, and we can take refuge in the feeling of needs met, broadly defined in terms of safety, satisfaction, and connection, the feeling of peace, contentment, and love. And we can gradually hardwire um, peace, contentment, and love, an authentic peace and contentment and love into ourselves so that our well-being and our resilience is increasingly unconditional, not based on external conditions around us. And interestingly, because I can't help myself, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna connect these three major kinds of refuges with each other. I'm gonna connect the notion of the Buddha, in, in particular the Buddha within, to the refuge of inner peace. I'm gonna connect his teachings, his dharma, about craving and the end of craving uh, to the refuge of contentment. And I'm gonna connect uh, the notion of the community, the congregation, uh, our fellow travelers, with the fundamental refuge of love, love flowing in as well as flowing out. And we'll kinda of see how that goes. Tonight, I wanna to talk about, as best we know, the Buddha's last words. And uh, if you received the email for um, tonight's gathering, um, you will have um, seen that quotation. And tonight, as in general, I will hold forth for a while till roughly a quarter past the hour, then start moving into responding to um, questions that have come in, hopefully related to the topic tonight and, and what I've been saying, uh, the questions that have come in through the chat. And uh, also, I'll try to open it up at least to one or more people to get your voices in the room uh, and uh, we'll end very, very close to half past the hour, you know, around the, around the corner. And then those of you who want can stick around uh, after we say goodbye to each other and then Tom Brown, my co-host here, will assign you into small breakout rooms within Zoom of roughly five people each if you want to hang out and talk further about the topics of the evening. So that's our, that's our structure. Okay. So here we have the Buddha, and we don't know for sure what he said. Uh, his teachings were handed down orally for several centuries before a written record survived. 
That said, there's a lot of consistency in what's been handed down, and you can imagine that his last words were regarded with a lot of care and respect. There are different translations of those last words, uh, and um, one I like best comes from Stephen Batchelor, and it um, is the quotation at the top of the last chapter, chapter 10 in my book, Neurodharma. And here's the quotation. So just kind of thinking about it and feeling into it and considering how we can relate to this as a refuge. Things fall apart. Tread the path with care. Those are some last words. <laughs> Things fall apart. Tread the path with care. So I'd like to talk a bit about this and explore two meanings of the word care and how we can find refuge, how we can find protection and sanctuary and refueling and inspiration and a kind of updraft as we deal with the challenges of life in the Buddha's final words. So first, we have the teaching that things fall apart. This is fundamental Buddhist teaching, fundamental teaching in other traditions, fundamental teaching in modern science of impermanence. Things fall apart. All which is subject to arising is subject to passing away. It may fall apart on a time scale of billions of years, or it may fall apart as our experiences continually decompose and become something else on a time scale of quarter seconds, milliseconds, right? But all experiences change. They are impermanent. They are compounded. They are uh, they occur due to their causes, they fall apart. And also conditions outside us fall apart as well. It may not seem like much of a refuge to um, take our seat in psychological groundlessness, the sense of things falling apart. And then actually, when we just kind of relax and we realize that, yeah, all our experiences change, we can't take them too seriously, you know, especially our views about other people and the time, um, our anxieties, our angers, when we realize that they fall apart inherently and we lighten up about that and we loosen up our grasping and our thingifying and our craving for one thing after another that's continually falling apart, including, as someone just said here in the chat, through entropy, we, we become more relaxed, weirdly. And the world around us. And here's an important point. Recognizing the truth of things does not mean agreeing with the truth of things or valuing the truth of things. It just means seeing the truth of things. And it can be, I think, weirdly comforting to realize that in human societies, things often do fall apart. It doesn't mean liking it. It doesn't mean approving of it we can simultaneously recognize the truth of things and take refuge in clear seeing about the truth of things while trying to make them better. The truth is most people throughout history have lived in tough times. And when I look back on my lifespan, born in 1952 in America, extremely born into a kind of a lower middle class family, um, but relatively high status because my dad was a professor. Uh, you know, I've just been a fortunate guy. It's easy to kind of think like, well, this is how it's supposed to be. And the truth is, it's been tough throughout history. And one thing that's happening certainly in America and perhaps elsewhere in the world is an overdue reckoning with the ways that it's been tough all along for a lot of other people in our own country. Um, and so there's something actually peaceful in taking refuge in a realism about human society, history, politics, and struggle. It doesn't mean turning a blind eye to it or shrugging in futility and defeat. There's actually a strange kind of refuge when you realize, yeah, conditions do fall apart. They really do. And to face that squarely. For me, I can say personally that I bow at the altar of reality most fundamentally. I want to know what's true. 
And what's true, as the Buddha taught, is that things fall apart. Our experiences fall apart. I had a surgeon client who said, all bleeding stops eventually, one way or another. It doesn't mean that you know, we're apathetic about it or we feel defeated about it, but there's just kind of a realism, weirdly. You know, when you just kind of recognize external conditions fall apart. So that's an offering for me, quoting the Buddha's last words and his teaching about that. Then we have the second sentence, so deep. Tread the path with care. How do we find refuge there? You know, it's interesting. The last words, there was nothing hocus pocus about it. There was no, like, listen to the priest from now on teaching. It was like, hey, you're kind of on your own. Things fall apart. Tread the path with care. So there's a sense of treading. We're moving. One breath at a time. The same to bed. If you take care of the minutes, the years will take care of themselves. One minute at a time. We tread. We keep going. And I think about the question for you, first, can you find comfort yourself in recognizing that things do fall apart and not resisting that fact, accepting it? For me, we suffer more when we don't accept the fact that things fall apart internally and externally. We add struggle and resistance to the, to the facts as they are. There's a release when we accept that things do fall apart. And there's also a kind of acceptance and joy when we recognize that each day we are treading a path. Each step matters. Each day matters. Each breath matters. Each minute matters in the paths we are treading. So here, I would ask you to reflect for a moment. What's your path? What's your path of practical wisdom, realism, prudence, thoughtfulness about others? What's your path these days? The more there are uncertainties around us, the more that there's um, conflicting information around us, the more that others may try to cloud our view, the more important it is to know what our path is through each day and then through the weeks and through the year. What's your path through the remainder of this year? For all kinds of reasons, including amidst most likely a continuing plague and full of consequences uh, around the world and in, in, and in my country, America. Right, what's your path? Can, do you know what your path is? Can you take refuge in the knowing of your path? That at least today, this is your plan. You're not sure what tomorrow may bring, but at least today this is your plan. This week this is your plan. Or you have some clarity about what you need to do, what you need to take care of. Lately I've been taking care of some kind of slightly overdue medical assessments to kind of deal with them um, early on. No problem, I'm doing fine. But you know, what's your path? And can you clarify your path? It's really useful to take refuge in the knowing of your path. Um, and then we come to care. This is where I really want to focus for the next 15 minutes or so before opening it up. Tread the path with care. Care. Care in two senses. Heartfeltness and conscientiousness. So right here, can you feel your heart? Both your physical heart, the area around your chest, and can you get a sense that you are bringing a whole heart to your own life? It's a kind of a relief to know that you, you don't have to be perfect, but you're approaching your life wholeheartedly with an open heart, with courage, an expansive heart. Yeah. Can you take refuge in your own heart? It's like standing in your heart amidst conflicts with others. Resting in your heart 
while, you, while worries pass through awareness. It's so different when we take refuge in our own heart from which we look out and see our worries, see our frustrations, see the things that um, make us angry, to rest in our heart. We see injustice, we don't know what to do. We rest in our heart. And neurobiologically, you know, there's a lot of really interesting research about heartfeltness and drawing on sensations in the area of the heart and drawing on what's called heart rate variability, which is the natural change of the interval between each beat. So that as you exhale, your heart naturally slows down. And as your heart rate slows down while exhaling, there's a calming and centering. And then as we inhale, the heart naturally speeds up. And as the uh, degree of uh, speeding up and the degree of slowing down increases slightly, even around a resting heart rate, that's let's say 70 beats a minute uh, or less, um, you know, that's a good marker of physical health, immune system function, and positive mood and resilience. So one thing we can do in terms of tread your path with care is to come back to the physical sense of the heart multiple times a day, to meditate while remaining in touch with the heart, to take refuge in the heart and refuge in a sense of your own lovingness, that you have a good heart. It's kind of a weird taboo, but just to ask you straight out, do you feel like you have a good heart? A lot of people, <laughs> that's a very uncomfortable question. And yet we can see that other people, at least most other people, clearly have a basically good heart. Yeah, they slip a little here, they cut a corner there, they get a little cranky sometimes. But they have a basically good heart. Can you see that about yourself? That you have a basically good heart. That's a really interesting refuge. One of the fundamental refuges for me that I've come to late in this life is to know that deep down I'm a basically good person. In different traditions, including in Buddhism, there's a notion of basic goodness, fundamental true nature. You know, you could have a sense of that. And you could just have a sense that, you know, when you look back in your life, deep down inside, you wish the best for yourself, for others. You had a basically good heart. You didn't wake up in the morning thinking to yourself, who could I hurt today? You just didn't. <laughs> you kind of woke up in the morning and you thought, how can I have a reasonably good day and you know, not be a total jerk and kind of help other people, maybe. Certainly help myself. You can have a good heart for yourself who's suffering you no better than anyone else is. These are refuges to know that you have a basically good heart and to rest in your own heart including through practices literally of tuning into sensation in this area, maybe with a hand on your heart, maybe deliberately taking longer exhalations, maybe exploring the rhythm of, um, you know, making sure that you exhale as long as you inhale back and forth. You know, you can take refuge in the heart, tread the path with care, bringing care. I think also that it's helpful to know that with other people, it's understandable sometimes that we get frustrated with them. Um, I live with my wife and our daughter and our daughter's cat and our son lives nearby. And I can tell you honestly that um, sometimes I get frustrated with them. Don't tell them, <laughs> they know it. And they get frustrated with me. The question isn't what arises in our mind. The question is whether it invades and remains as the Buddha taught. And increasingly, the question is, uh, what are we mostly grounded in, even when things like frustrations or irritations wander through awareness, are we mainly rested in our own heartfeltness, our own care, our own goodness? You know, is that where we're mainly rested? And that's a phenomenal refuge. It's so practical in everyday life. And one way to come home to it is to anchor the emotion of heartfeltness and, and a sense of um, strong-heartedness 
and courage, actually, with others, to anchor it with sensation in the area of your heart. I do a little unobtrusive thing where I'll sometimes just kind of touch my rib cage or my sternum, you know, the center of the rib cage, uh, when I'm having a heartfelt feeling uh, to sort of anchor the sensation so that unobtrusively down the road, this is an NLP technique, neuro linguistic prog programming, you know, just by touching the center of my chest, it associates to the emotion that I want to activate or the way of being I want to call up uh, with repetition. So, heartfeltness and care. And then last, certainly, there is the refuge of the other meaning of um, care, conscientiousness. Uh, we can be very heartfelt. We can be ardent, passionate, enthusiastic for practice, but really not conscientious, not resolute, not diligent. You know, it can be all over the place. And there's a place for conscientiousness. I mean, there's this recurring description of a um, um, res you know, respect, respect-worthy practitioner. You know, this is how to be, basically. There's a recurring description of that in the, the early teachings of the Buddha. And that description has four aspects to it. Uh, one is, uh, you know, sincerely practicing, who is ardent, heartfelt, enthusiastic, passionate, ardent, mindful, aware, tracking what's happening, outer and inner, and resolute, determined, and diligent, conscientious. Breath after breath, minute after minute, day after day, conscientious. So you might ask yourself, first, can you recognize how you are already conscientious? That, you know, you're, you're, you, you take care of your side of the street. You clean up your mess. You do your job, whatever that is. You know, that there's a conscientiousness to it. Uh, if you're practicing sobriety, one more day, conscientious. If you're committed to a spiritual practice of some time, you know, you're conscientious about it. Uh, if you're just, if you have jobs, you know, like, what is Zen? The Zen master was asked, he said, after eating, clean your bowl. <laughs> Chop wood, carry water. Conscientious. That's a great refuge. You know, uh, early on, uh, not so early, uh, in my marriage and soon after we had kids, uh, I started reflecting on my job description as a provider, a father, and a husband in, in my frame. And I wanted to do a good job. And I... So I think about not to internalize a kind of oppressive, burdensome, you know, rules from other people, but to decide for ourselves sincerely, what's your good enough job description? When you go to bed, what's a good enough day? And can you say to yourself, good day, that was a good day. You did a good job today in however you define it, including in relationships with others. That's a great refuge. Uh, the Buddha talked about the bliss of blamelessness. Not as some kind of unattainable standard, but a good enough. Yeah, good enough, good job, right? That's a really good thing to take refuge in, to know that you tried today, you did your best today. And is there anything that you might like to get a little more impeccable about, <laughs> a little more diligent about, not in some burdensome way. At this time, um, when things have fallen apart in a lot of ways, it's led to a lot more work in, in some kinds of ways, whatever it might be, How, you know, taking care of others, uh, working in new ways, cleaning our groceries when we bring them home, maybe you know, inconveniences, hassles, maybe really serious consequences that we've had to grapple with economically and perhaps in terms of our health. So there's, there's more to do. So I'm not trying to add yet more things to do, to do. On the other hand, it could well be that there's some knowing in oneself, like, yeah, I'm gonna be a little more careful about that, a little more conscientious about that, a little more diligent. And you can take refuge in that. And with other people, uh, when other people have um, their complaints, their unmet needs, their wants, their wishes, their hurts, 
their reproaches, their grievances, uh, can we uh, think to ourselves, okay, from now on, I'm going to implement that. From now on, I'm going to take care of that. I'm going to zero out the complaint, as it were. Uh, partly out of enlightened self-interest, because it will give you one less thing to complain about, <laughs> but also out of benevolence and goodness and kindness for the other person, conscientiousness. So, I think about this last words, these last words of the Buddha, which are sometimes translated as, be a lamp unto yourself, be a light unto yourself. Maybe perhaps miraculously translated as Stephen Batchelor has done it here. Things fall apart, um, tread the path with care. Can you accept that things do fall apart and find refuge in that acceptance? Can you know what your path is? Whatever it is, both through everyday life and your path up, your personal mountain of awakening, your personal path of awakening, do you know what that path is? And can you know you take refuge in it? As Jack Cornfield's book is titled, um, do you have a feeling? Do you have confidence that you're walking a path with heart, a path with heart? Can you take refuge in knowing that you're walking a path with heart? And can you find refuge in your own heart? Your sense of care, that you bring caring, you bring lovingness, you bring compassion. You're not perfect, you're still working on it, right? Uh, I think Suzuki Roshi said, you're perfect as you are, and you could use a little improvement, right? So there's an improvement process, and still, there is true caringness already. Can you find refuge in that? And can you find refuge in that other aspect of care, treading the path with care? Conscientiousness, being resolute and diligent. Um, both recognizing the ways you already are and enjoying the refuge of the bliss of blamelessness and uh, think about, all right, is there maybe a, a way to, at least a little bit each day, raise my own game? Um, so I'll finish here. Uh, I'm please, I'm looking forward to the questions, the comments coming in um, in the chat. So if you have a question or a comment, could be a nightmare scenario, I'm going to try to take it. Uh, I'm happy to respond to people um, also, and I'll kind of wander through the, um, the thumbnails, and I, I'll tend to call on people uh, to, to get their voices in the room whose voices are unlike mine, uh, to get you know, a wider range of voices in the room. And the last thing I'll just say here is that I really encourage you to keep coming. You know, there's a refuge in coming together here. And in um, the evenings to come, I'm going to explore in some very fundamental and, and neuropsychologically informed ways uh, other kinds of refuges, including ways we can develop more resilience inside and more you know, stability of contentment and love inside amidst really shaky times. Okay. So I'm going to keep people muted um, on, unless I call on a person in particular, then I'll unmute you and um, arrange for you to unmute yourself. But uh, right now I'm going to respond to questions that have come in on chat. So I want to respond to the question that has come really early on uh, about this whole topic of refuge altogether. And it came in from, da da. Well, Okay, so I'm going to find it. But basically what I remember was, is refuge a way of avoiding feelings? And that's a very important question. Here we go from RE. Uh, isn't refuge, isn't finding refuge running away from our emotions? It can be. John Wellwood, bless him, no longer alive, uh, described, referred to a, a spiritual bypass where we use our, our tricks and our methods to avoid facing what there could be to face. Now, sometimes, frankly, uh, we do that because that's skillful. We can't bear it any longer. It's too upsetting. We can't deal with it. So we turn on the TV and watch something else, or we go for a walk, or we take refuge in a chocolate chip cookie, something. Uh, you know, sometimes that's what we need to do to get to the other side. Okay. It's important to know that you're doing that. But other times, often, you know, yeah, we seek refuge as a form of escapism. We have to be careful about that. On the other hand, just because there is that pitfall to beware doesn't mean that inherently finding refuge 
such as in an underlying sense of calm strength or open-heartedness or contentment already, gratitude, let's say, already, you know, drawing on those as refuges or other forms of refuge like uh, nature or other people or um, spiritual practices of various kinds or exercise, yoga, et cetera, art, et cetera, et cetera, singing, whatever, doesn't mean that we're finding those refuges to avoid our feelings. And if anything, as again, much research has shown, as people uh, develop the sense of refuges around them, and as people cultivate internal refuges that they, they can be in touch with, such as the refuge of feeling that others care about you genuinely, and that is internalized. As they do that, they become more able to bear painful emotions in themselves and in other people, and to, to stand strong and to bear witness. Um, uh, to the difficult emotions of themselves and other people. You know, for me, refuge, uh, you know, and the seeking of refuge involves um, an honest kind of humility. American culture, you know, and, and Western culture and other kinds of culture, you know, there, there's a grandiosity kind of baked into it. And actually, we're frail. Things fall apart. We need refuge because things fall apart, right? We don't have superpowers. We're not omnipotent. There's a healthy humility <laughs> in recognizing, whoa, we need help. I need a little help here. <laughs> Where can I go? You know, whether it's a kid finding, you know, security in an attachment figure or an adult taking refuge in deep wisdom, profound wisdom around from of the ages, you know, we need we need refuges. So Okay, another comment or question? Let's see here. I'm gonna bounce toward the end of the chat. Um, and it's great that people are commenting to each other. Uh, taking solace, uh, I think solace is a kind of refuge, right? Uh, finding meaning, finding healing, that's certainly a kind of refuge. Uh, one detail here is that um, I think, you know, it, it's sort of easy to, sneer at the refuges other people find, but privilege the refuges we find. And I think it's important to be a little careful about that, you know. Uh, so I think we might look at another person and think, oh, you know, you're finding refuge in a bag of popcorn. That's how you're getting through it. And yet for them, that's a really important refuge in a very difficult and challenging life. We don't know. So that, okay, any more comments or questions? Da, da, da. Uh, transcript sessions, uh, we record these. We don't have transcripts of them. Uh, we do transcripts in some, many of my programs, um, but we don't do transcripts here, but we do record it. And I think these days you can get transcriptions of them. Okay. Da -da -da -da. Um, all right. Barbara asks a very good question, makes a comment. Sometimes when trying to find refuge in the heart centeredness, I notice all the ways I'm not loving how I can be critical and so forth. That's very natural. And sometimes what happens is that because the brain associates to the opposite, to the yin, the yang, you know, of what we're experiencing or to other things, when we start to open up to, let's say, heartfeltness, open-heartedness, uh, we can have a sense of how we're not open-hearted or how um, if we open our heart, that makes us more vulnerable to being hurt and let down by other people. That's a natural thing. And then sometimes we can close up, we can back away. It's very important to be able to tolerate these other experiences that come up and stay the course, tread the path. Keep treading the path to know that, okay, um, yes, I got it. When I get in touch with my heartfeltness, I'm aware also of ways, you know, I've been mean to other people or uh, was oblivious to my impact on them. Darn. Okay. And can I or you take refuge in knowing that you're prepared to repair? To know, even if other people won't repair with you, that there's a sincerity in your heart and a willingness, as appropriate, you know, to repair. To take responsibility for your part of it, 
in some ways, even if you were well-intended or even if you just didn't know, but at least, okay, I got it. I, I, I had that impact on you. And what can we do going forward? Just to know that in yourself, to know that you are someone who is prepared to repair is a really good refuge to rest in. It's not that we're feeling superior. Well, I'm willing to repair. Why not you? You know, it's just a genuineness, like you're willing to repair. That's a good thing to know. So whatever it is you find in yourself, you know, that um, there's a willingness to repair it. You know, the Buddha, one of the standards for monastics every month was a willingness to look hard at um, what there was to correct in themselves, in their thoughts, word, and deeds. And to have um, a kind of version of what you find in Alcoholics Anonymous, a fearless searching inventory. Not critical, but fearless and searching of oneself. And then on the basis of that, a willingness to acknowledge and repair and recommit to treading the path with care going forward. That's a very important thing and we can take refuge in it. And it can really help us. Someone brought up forgiveness, which is a very deep refuge. Um, it can help us to forgive ourselves. You know, um, I've, off, I've had times, including on meditation retreats, when I was just rot, racked with sorrow for, for and hurt and anger about how other people had treated me. Uh, and then racked with sorrow for how I had treated them, you know, in part because of how they had treated me, da 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 da, da. And I was practicing forgiving them for their part, you know, uh, for their part, while recognizing very much my own part in the matter. We stand on firmer ground to forgive others their part after we've taken responsibility for our own part, obviously. Uh, and then, though, I wasn't free until I forgave myself for what happened and the history, you know. And we're not on solid ground to forgive ourselves until we've moved through appropriate remorse, appropriate reckoning, appropriate repentance, and appropriate willingness to repair. But then on the basis, we can move into um, a forgiveness of ourselves uh, and then moving, move forward. And I, that's a phenomenal refuge, phenomenal refuge. Okay, I want to move into seeing who has questions and comments so far. Uh, I saw that Julian uh, has a question or a comment. I'm scrolling through the screens. Let me see if I can make sure, whoops. Hmm. I'm trying to make sure that I can. Okay, so I'm going to mute all, but I'm going to allow you to unmute yourselves. Great. So, Julian, you can unmute yourself, and I'm searching for you in the screens here. Julian Smith? What's going on? How are you doing? Hey, hey good. Good Thank to see you. you. Good to see you, too. Um, so, I... <laughs> Trying to express a feeling. I've had a lot of uh, trauma, you know, that I've dealt with uh, that I see a therapist for and I'm, you know, working through it and all that stuff. But one of the things that, um, uh, you know, and I'm just learning to do resourcing and yada, yada through therapy. Um, but one of the things I'm always a little bit frustrated with in terms of finding refuge and just some of the, the ways that words are used in the Buddhist and insight tradition is, um, it's, it's always kind of seems, I took a, for example, I took a mindful self-compassion class at the insight school in LA and I was always getting into arguments with the two teachers because they would always be like, well, just have compassion for yourself. And, for me, I was just like, well, what if you don't even know what have, having compassion for yourself even means? You know, it just seemed like they were answering the question that I had with a question, you know. So when you're talking about, you know, and that's kind of also related to just finding refuge in yourself, you know, like I, you know, I, I still struggle. I've been seeing my therapist for years. And I still struggle sometimes with her when we're doing like resourcing and sort of finding that place, you know, just mm -hmm. because how do you find something that you'd never, you know, when you're this a child, is deep. You know, yeah. find the thing that you don't, you yeah. haven't felt. It's like, yeah. you'll find the alien, you know, what's the alien look like? Well, I don't know. Like yeah. alien, 
like that other alien over there. You know, it's like you don't know. Yeah. There's no way for. So you have to like stumbled on it by accident, you know. And yeah, I, now that I'm not like I'm always anxious, even though I'm often anxious. It's not like I'm like that all the time. You know, I was just in um, the Sierras this past weekend out in nature you know, and enjoying the nature and it was peaceful. And, you know, I found that, that place, but it's not, then I come back to LA, it's like, oh crap, I'm at work, blah, 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 blah. So I'm just right. jumping back and forth. I'm never, it's never in the background. You know what I mean? So Yeah. Well, let me really speak to it because, wow, did you bring up a lot of really good relevant stuff and, and right at the heart of practice, right? So <clears throat> a few, to me, headlines here. Uh, we always have to start with an experience. Now, sometimes the experience is initially just conceptual, where a friend, a teacher might say something and we stare at them like, are you kidding? But what? <laughs> but at least we get the idea, right? So, okay. and that's okay. We start with the idea, right? So let's say, I'm gonna go after compassion here. So I, I wanna appreciate you as, you know, stepping into this here. So we go, okay, compassion, the idea. Compassion, two, two qualities, empathy for suffering and benevolence, goodwill. All right, we feel it and we wish them well. Even if we disagree, even if we think it's their fault, deep down, we wish that they suffer less. And that's sincere inside ourselves. Okay, so we have those two elements. We know that conceptually. Then we move into the experience of it in whatever way we possibly can feel. And this goes back to any little thing is useful. And I, I really go after the, the simplest, barest, kind of most in our animal nature-ness, <laughs> the most sensory, the most fundamental qualities of it. Right? So with oneself, are we open to how we really feel? You know, right there. So the empathy for oneself, that first of two aspects of compassion for oneself. Is there actually an opening to it? Are we honest about it? Can we name it to ourselves, how we really feel? At least in some way, you know? And for example, just the whole thing of something that physically hurts or, you know, we're tired. It's, it's hard not to notice when you're tired, right? I'm tired. Well, that's empathy for yourself or my back hurts. Well, that's empathy for, for pain. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very elemental. Um, my, right now, my mouth's a little dry, it's fine. But, oh, my mouth's a little dry. Uh, it's very, very calm. And, and so we start with what's real for us, and then we build out from there. This is a very important point. Whether we work with other people as a coach or a therapist or a teacher, uh, or whether we're working with ourselves, we start with what's real. And we tread our path. We go after it. You know, we're in pursuit of what's real there. We want to feel it. You might want to mute yourself, Julian, if it's okay, because we're going to finish up pretty soon too. So then let's go to the, the, the caring aspect of compassion, the goodwill, the warmth. All right. Right there again, um, what can we feel for ourselves that's real? So we think, well, I don't like this headache. I don't want this headache. Or, well, it's real. I liked the mountains. LA drives me crazy. By the way, I grew up in LA. <laughs> I, I relate. I, you know, it's, it's cool, a lot of cool people, but I was happy to get out of there. So, okay, right there. I don't like it here you know, dislike, I don't like it here. I wish, I don't like that I don't like it here, right? It's unpleasant, right? That just simplicity of that, ugh, bummer. The drag, the bummerness of it, the pressure of it. I, I'm, I feel pressure, I don't like feeling pressure. I feel hassled, I don't like feeling hassled. I wish I didn't feel hassled. Right there, you're moving into compassion for yourself in a really basic way. Um, let's see, and Oh, I see. I'm going to mute everybody else because we're coming to the end here. I'm going to mute all and I'm not going to let you unmute yourself. Sorry about that because we're finishing up. So I'll finish up in the next minute or so. Um, so 
this this is how to do it. This is really how to do it. It's to so what what's in what I'm saying? A recognition of what would help you. Turn to help. So important. What would help you? What would help? Second, get an get an experience of it. Break it down into its parts. You know, go after what's real for you. Build from there and stay with it. That's in what I'm saying. And then, as you know, Julian, you know, um, we, we've talked a bit, really help it sink into your body. So more and more, it becomes established in you. You know, the, the, probably the most fundamental teaching of the Buddha about practice, the very thorough teaching of the Satipatthana Sutta, Sati being mindfulness, Patana being sometimes called foundations. It really means establishments. You know, we're establishing in ourselves progressively what we're trying to grow and cultivate for the sake of others as well as the sake of ourselves. And so when we scratch and claw sometimes our way through the underbrush of confusion and distraction, boom, for a second or a breath, we're actually experiencing something wholesome, something beneficial for us and probably for many others too. When we have that, when we finally get that song playing in the inner iPod, whew, turn on the recorder, right? And slow it down and value it. And then what will increasingly happen, to go to the kind of tail end of, of your comment and question, what will increasingly happen is you will develop this as a trait. For example, self-compassion is a trait. And it will become more and more natural. And there's this process of growth. You may, you may have heard this, the four stages of learning from unconscious incompetence to conscious incompetence to conscious competence to unconscious competence. Also summarized in the trajectory of his own life from described by Milarepa, the great Tibetan sage, in the beginning, nothing came. Conscious incompetence. He couldn't get anything going. And then in the middle, nothing stayed. Conscious competence it was good, but he had to be deliberate about it. And then in the end, nothing left. Unconscious competence in the cultivation of whatever it is we're trying to develop. And that really works. It really works. Um, again and again and again and again. And that's where the humility comes in too. It's like the humility to realize, like, I need to do more weight training. <laughs> Tom's going to help me. Uh, you know, the humility of recognizing, oh, I actually have to lift the darn things to, you know, build the muscles. Oh, there's a humility. There's a, things fall apart. We got to make effort. Entropy, rust never sleeps, right? We have to make efforts to help them cohere and glue together. Really important. And we can take refuge in the knowing of that and in our efforts for that in much the same way, you know, in our own development and progression. We need to have the humility that recognizes the necessity of practice in little ways, and some big ones that add up authentically, credibly over time, in which then we can take refuge and confidence in our own practice.